We are so nervous. No, we're not. <laughs> so nervous. Not really. We had how many conversations about whether or not you were going to bring your purse out on stage with you? I fixed yeah. my hair about 20 times and I don't have right. that much of it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so the thing to watch for tonight is when we're on stage together and I say something that mom doesn't like, she does this little sort of hand thing like this. <laughs> so count the number of times she does the hand thing. We had dinner before we came over here, and I, I, I mentioned this thing that happened with Steve Martin at the uh, 92nd Street Y in New York, and you hadn't heard anything about no, this, right? No, okay. I so what happened is apparently, uh, how, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience know the story I'm about to tell, but Steve Martin had a book come out recently that, that touched on, I guess, the art world, and uh, he did an event at the 92nd Street Y, which is a, a big sort of cultural space in New York. You've been there several times, right. and he wasn't funny at all. And uh, people were watching online and they were, um, they were uh, streaming the event on their computers and they started emailing to complain. And so they passed a note up onto the stage and said, you know, like, get funny, you know? <laughs> talk about the Oscars, talk about it's complicated. And there was a big stink about it. So I was sitting there reading the story thinking, what would the Rices have to do to disappoint the audience that extremely? <laughs> I guess if we talked about nothing but Jersey Shore for an hour. Yeah. yeah. What's Jersey Shore? What's Jersey Shore? I'm so glad you said that. Um, we're here to talk about writing. That's basically what we agreed at dinner. We're here to talk about the process of writing. What it means to be a writer, the sacrifices you have to make to do this as not necessarily a living but as a vocation. And so I wanted to start by reading a quote from you, which is what um, Life Talks LA used to promote this event on their website. And the quote reads, on writing, my advice is the same to all. If you want to be a writer, write. Write and write and write. If you stop, start again. Save everything that you write. If you feel blocked, write through it until you feel your creative juices flowing again. Write dot, 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 I don't know what they left out there. But you go on to say, go where the pain is. Write the book you would like to read. Write the book you have been trying to find but have not found, but write. That's my basic advice. And I get emails every day asking me what my advice is. And I say that in one form or another over and over again, that there's nothing to talk about if you don't write. You've got to do that. That's what makes a writer nothing, there's nothing really to discuss if you don't write, and you've just got to do that, and you've got to make yourself do that. And um, I didn't just say, go where the pain is. I also said, go where the pleasure is. Okay. Because I believe both those things are important. Right. And you have to write the book that you want to read yourself. Right. If you ever find yourself writing a book that you would not read, you're in trouble. So I'm asked this question all the time. What was the single most effective piece of advice you've gotten from your mother on writing, um, as opposed to driving? Uh, As opposed to what? Driving, which you have never done in my lifetime. Never driven a car in my lifetime. What, me? Yeah, you've never gotten behind the wheel of a car. Uh, no, I do. I, well, go ahead. What? I know how to drive, but I just don't do it. The secret life of Anne Rice comes out. Um, right. Okay. The advice that you gave me was write the book that you want to read. And when people ask me what I, what I believe you meant by that, it was if you are writing the book that you think the critics will like to read, or the award committees will like, and you don't like it yourself, that's right. there's, a, there's a disturbing discrepancy there that's gonna, that's gonna hang you up down the road. Is that, am well, I putting words in your mouth? Absolutely, it has to be the book that you would read yourself, the book of your dreams, and it has to be the best that you can do, as if you've just been given the diagnosis that you're gonna die and you mm -hmm. only have six months to, to do this. The book that you wanna leave behind. If you don't give it all of that, it's really, I don't think, worth doing. Now, there are a lot of kinds of writers, and this advice, like any advice to a writer, doesn't mean a whole lot. If it doesn't work for you, ignore it, because this is the one profession where there are no rules. And what I'm saying um, may not work for people in this audience, it may not work for you. I mean, and throw it out if it doesn't. That's mm -hmm. my other piece of advice, don't listen to advice. Right. Or don't, don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't be abused by advice. Right. Um, I remember a point in my life when I was struggling to be a writer and people gave me a lot of really bad advice. They told me I like wasn't what? a writer. I wasn't a real writer. I didn't have what it took because Why I didn't, you a real I didn't write every day. 
Oh. I would stare at the wall for six months. You know, and they'd say, well, you're not a real writer. No real writer can stay away from it every day. Really? Uh, I mean, or, you know, every, every, you have to be driven to do it. They would give me all these definitions. They would give me right. all these ways to approach it. I even had a teacher in college tell me that I wasn't a real writer because I wrote on a typewriter. Really? Yeah, she said that's good for a journalist, but that's not what a real writer does. You were to be writing by, by hand on paper, is that? That's what she okay. indicated. Of course, now I think that looks particularly foolish because so many people um, use computers now to write. In fact, almost everybody. Though I do know people that write by hand, actually, and are professional writers, mm -hmm. in fact. But the point I was trying to make is that n any advice you have to be willing to throw out. Mm -hmm. But we're here to give the best advice that we can based on our experience. Based on our experience. So, I think yeah, all right. that every writer has right. is their experience. And a lot of times when you talk to groups of writers, they really only have one question, which is how do I get published? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the hardest one to answer. My answer is B. Ann Rice's son. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it helps. It helped to get an agent to read your yeah. manuscript, but that's all it really helped because nobody in New York is going to publish you just because you're someone's son. So well, that has to be said. They, they may not publish you twice, but, but <laughs> they may publish you once because I've read those books. Um, <laughs> moving on. That, that was, I mean, that was a lot of bad advice that you were given early yeah. on. And, and so where was that happening? Was it happening in academia? Was it happening in, in writers' workshops that you were attending that were independent? It was happening in the Haight-Ashbury in our apartment with the friends that we had. Okay. You know, that was just them telling me what their definition of a writer was. The college advice happened on a college campus in 1960, 61. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't fit in a, in a, in a college environment. Uh, I, I didn't get good grades. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't get good grades in composition because I wrote long sentences, used too many adjectives. Isn't this almost a, a yeah. cliche, though? I mean, isn't this almost a cliche in the sense that there's such a long list of really successful, really talented writers who were told to give it up because they were bad at composition? I mean, somebody essentially yeah. said the same thing to James Lee Burke, who is arguably one of the best living mystery writers in America right, right now. Yeah. The other thing that shocks people when, when I talk about this period of your life, which is sort of trying to get started and, and finding uh, your area of focus thematically, was that so many people laughed at you for wanting to write about vampires. Oh, oh absolutely. After I wrote Interview with a Vampire, um, I submitted it to this contest in Northern California, which was very important to me, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award. And I learned later that the reader threw it out, just mm -hmm. threw the manuscript out because of the title, apparently. And Interview with a Vampire still uh, incurs that kind of dismissal. That, that will happen amongst people who haven't read it or haven't maybe heard from people who have read it. Um, so I've kind of faced that all my life, uh, being ridiculed and being dismissed. And at the same time, I've been very, very generously rewarded by the world as mm -hmm. a writer. Can't complain. I mean, treated really, really well and fulfilled many of my dreams. But I'm always being humbled and reminded, you know, that I can be dismissed and condemned and, and am daily. You know? What's the source of the dismissal, do you think? Well, you, I think any writer has to face that there are some people who are not going to like what you do and they're not going to think it's very good. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's certainly been true all my life. I mean, I just looked on the internet the other day and ran across a review of a recent book of mine and the person said, this woman does not know how to write. She needs to take a course in creative writing. She simply doesn't know how to write a book. Yeah. This is terrible stuff. Right. You know, I mean, I, I can go back on Amazon.com and find reviews of almost any book I've written that will say essentially that same thing. This is like walking through mud. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is just terrible. This is unbelievably boring. I mean, how, why do people talk about Anne Rice? She doesn't, you know, this is excruciating, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. And I think you have to accept that you write the best book that you know how to write, the book that you want to read, the book that you believe in, and you are going to expect that some people are not going to get it. And they're not going to think it's very good. And you have to not let that stop you. Mm -hmm. if, if you get afraid as you're sitting there at the computer, if you're afraid, if you can hear them snickering and laughing, and mm -hmm. I can actually hear them all the time, yeah. <laughs> say too many adjectives, you know, just mm -hmm. purple prose, you know, mm -hmm. vampires with feelings, you know. <laughs> Vampire, existential vampires talking right. about the meaninglessness of life. But what's insulting about that description? 
you know? Yeah, well, for me, it's great. You yeah, know, all of it. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, absolutely. But the point I'm making is that you're always going against that. You're always having faith in yourself. That's all you can do. Years ago, somebody asked the author of Roots, what the most important thing was for a writer. Roots was a huge success at that time as a mm -hmm. miniseries. It was like nothing that had ever happened before in television, really. And he said, faith. You have to have faith in yourself. That's really what matters. And, and what I tell people also now when they email me, and I get emails every day asking for advice, I say, you need as much courage as talent. Mm. You just have to hang in there, and you have to protect your work, and you have to believe in it, and you have to ignore rejection. What does protecting your work involve? Don't change it for everybody who criticizes it. Right. And when you send it to a publishing house and they say, uh, we don't know what this is about and we don't understand it, move on. Right. Go to the next publishing house and the one after that and the one after that until somebody says, boy, I really got it. Right. I really understand this. I really, I really know what you're doing here. Then you listen to mm. suggestions or criticism or editorial uh, advice, but not for somebody who doesn't get your work. That's what I mean by protect it. And not from someone who isn't willing to pay for your work. <laughs> that sounds really crass. What happens is they get so afraid in the wake of those rejections that they begin to muddy down their manuscript that's, that's because of dismissals that probably have nothing really to do with the content of your yeah. book. They have to do with the mood that woman or man was in that day when they read your manuscript. And so you're, you're trying to rearrange the planets in this universe for people you have no visual on that you've never met or even really talked to on the phone. And it, it, writers can kill their own work that way, don't you well, think? Well, th that's exactly what I'm talking right. about. I mean, in the early stages, it can happen with writers' groups. You can go to groups and, and the group can tear the work apart and you can constantly rewrite and rewrite for that group. That's not a healthy or good thing, I don't think. If it works for you, fine it is. But I mean, usually it, it, it can be very destructive. But with publishers, that is really the truth. And, and if you get any group of editors from New York, experienced editors, if you get them together and get them talking and ask them questions, they will all tell you about great books that they turned down, mm -hmm. bestsellers that they didn't get, that right. just turned out to be blockbusters on all different levels, from the literary to the most transparently entertainment fiction. They all have those stories. So if they criticize your work or if they reject it, that's not a pass or fail grade. It has nothing to do with that. It simply means that that person doesn't respond enough to what you've done to work with it and see it published. Mm -hmm. That's really all it means. Right. You can be a genius and they can feel that way. Right. Well, let's talk about the place that you were in when you wrote Interview with the Vampire because the other piece of advice that was in that quote I read from you is, is essentially to write the book that you think is missing, that's, right. that's maybe right. not out there. And, and how did interview fit that criteria? I had never been satisfied by what was done with horror fiction. I had loved movies I'd seen as a child, like Dracula's Daughter. Um, I don't think I'd seen the original Dracula yet, but I had seen other vampire movies, and I'd found them very romantic and tantalizing. But I wanted to know about the main figure. I wanted to know what the feelings of the vampire were. I wanted mm. to know what he did when he got home early in the morning before climbing in his coffin, you know? <laughs> that was it. I mean, what books did he read, you know? Right. What, what did he, well, how did he feel about taking life? How did he feel about drinking blood? So the whole effort was to do that, to, to get into that, that cartoon figure, really, with the black cape mm -hmm. and the pale skin and the um, mesmerizing eyes and have him talk about what that was like to hear the heartbeat of another slowing down right next to him. And I really got into it. I totally loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I broke through when I wrote that book. I'd never really been able successfully to write anything in terms of pedestrian realism. And that's what was really in fashion when I was a student at that time. Tell us what pedestrian realism is. Well. Um, Realistic books about ordinary people, almost always middle class or upper middle class, involving small problems to which there are no real solutions, and where there is a, a, a climax and a resolution of the book that has to do with acceptance. That was very much... Acceptance the, of the problem. Acceptance of okay. the problem, acceptance of the world. I mean, uh, Americans living in quiet desperation. That, mm -hmm. that was the fiction uh, that was very popular at my time. That's what was considered to be the highest literature. It still is to a I large was going to ask you, do you think it still is? Uh, yeah, oh, very much. I mean, there's still, there's still a bias, but, but people are much more willing to read entertainment fiction now than they were then, at mm -hmm. least in the environment I was in. But to write about a vampire and what a vampire felt 
to, to talk about a vampire coming out of um, antebellum Louisiana and um, you know, being an immortal old world monster. Mm -hmm. and th that, all that was just completely unacceptable in the milieu in which I was writing. I was, I was just laughed at. I mean, that was, they, people just didn't know what to do with it. And I remember telling my father, um, I'd started to send the manuscript out, and I said, it'd been about nine months, and I said, Dad, I think I've done something terrible here. I put everything into this book, and it's in a form that people never accept. And he said, well, be careful what you wish for, honey, because you just might get it. And then the call came from New York that the book was accepted, and I got a very big advance for it. And within a couple of years, it was on the bestseller list. Right. So I did get what I was asking for. Right. He was right. If you had to pick between these two themes that run through the Vampire Chronicles, but they also run through the lives of the Mayfair Witches, and they also run through a lot of the other supernatural work that you've done, um, this sort of natural imperative that many of us have to take a life to survive, or sense that we have to take a life to survive, as the vampires do, and as the witches often have to, and the theme of immortality. Which is the one that compels you more? And do you think you can you pull them apart, or are they inextricably linked? The, the theme of taking a life to survive, what people are willing to do to survive, that's really what those books are all about. Mm -hmm. And of course, immortality is the lure, but I think the immortality in those books is a metaphor for our consciousness, the fact that we feel immortal right now. Mm -hmm. We feel we aren't going to die. You know, everybody else probably will, but not us. Do you, do you feel you're not going to die? Because I should Not answer. at this point, not okay. at this age. But <laughs> do you, did that get passed on to me? Because I have plans. <laughs> no, no. But, but I do think that when you're growing up, you feel that an exception is going an to exception. be made. The end of the world will come. Something will happen, but you will not die. It'll happen to everyone. Yeah. But there was yeah. a survey, I think it was a local safety organization did, of people here in Southern California. What will you do when the big one hits? And none of them answered, I'll die. <laughs> none of them answered, I'll be the one that gets crushed by the beam. They all said, well, I'll be out helping people. I'll drive people to safety. But there's the very real possibility that you'll be the dead one. Exactly. But, but nobody, we don't, we can't default to that. And if we always did, life would be kind of unbearable. I mean, maybe there are well, many yeah, of it, us it for whom be. it is for that reason. But it, it would be. Yeah. Stephen King said that imagination is the ability to drive down the highway and imagine a car from the opposite side of the freeway flipping end over end over end into your car and, you know, landing you in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's his definition of imagination. <laughs> a better America maybe would be my definition of imagination, but what is your definition of imagination? Certainly it's to imagine that, but it's to empathize, to know right. what people feel and to be able to describe that and to make the people who read your book feel it mm -hmm. so that they can't get away from it almost. Right. You know, so that they, they just keep coming back and back and they, they call you and ask you, do vampires really exist? Right. Is Lestat real? Is Louis real? Right. <laughs> I hate to ask you this, Mrs. Rice, but are they real? <laughs> I know. Mom, what's also notable is that <laughs> you answered the phone when those people called. I do. <laughs> A lot. Well, A lot. I, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, I answer their emails too. Yeah, you've had an interesting history with the internet. You know, you were not someone who, and I mm -hmm. can say this with some assurance, that you didn't you didn't get online right away. No, no, not and, until about two thousand five. Right, think. and I never, I don't think we exchanged an email until two thousand five. Right. Yeah. And now we email two. 20 times a day, but the point I'm trying to make is that you are very active on the internet. You have right. 160,000 Facebook followers, mm -hmm. uh, and you contribute regularly to discussion forums right. where people don't believe it's really you, and you have to sort of convince them it's you. Yeah, that's um, question. How is that feeding your work today? How is that feeding your life as a writer? Because there, there is the story of you know Margaret Mitchell allegedly never wrote a sequel to Gone with the Wind because all she did was answer her fan mail. Well, you she know. also got hit by a car. Well, that. <laughs> Not immortal. <laughs> now, if she'd added a vampire in the mix, as I'm sure someone will in a few months to make some, a quick buck, gone with the wind and vampires. Right. Back to the question of the Facebook page. You're asking right. me how it works. Well, I, I'm still in the process of finding out how it works. Um, but I'm having a incredibly wonderful experience on yeah. Facebook. I mean, um, I feel like I'm a, a member of this community mm -hmm. on the page. And I love going on there every morning and sharing links to stories in the New York Times and the LA Times, the Huffington Post, the Boston 
globe, whatever, you know, with the people of the page, and then asking them questions about what they feel. So it's functioning in some ways as a distraction, mm -hmm. because there's always that to do rather than write. But it's also telling me who my people are, my audience. They're always asking me right. questions. I go to the part of the page where they can post their individual questions, and I answer as many every morning as I can. Mm -hmm. And I love doing this. I love interacting with them. They ask about writing. They, uh, we share a lot about the television shows we're watching, the movies. Mm -hmm. If I get tremendously enthusiastic about an actor, like Richard Armitage or Matthew McFadden, these wonderful British actors that are in so many BBC programs. Um, I go on and talk about that. They'll mention their experience of what they've seen with that actor and so forth, that they'll recommend something. They recommend films to me, they recommend TV. We talk about all this. We talk a lot about the books. I know who they are, mm -hmm. this audience. Right. I know who they are. So I don't, feel, um, I don't feel the kind of isolation I used to feel before. Um, I know they're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can literally go and, and ask them the most serious question that's tormenting me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why is this happening? Or what do you think about conscience versus a code of ethics that somebody says, you know, what, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And they'll give me all these answers, 500 posts. 500 within a couple responses, of hours, and, right. Absolutely. And I'll answer many of them and get in there and begin to argue with them about whatever. Right. You right. know, it, or is going on. And to me, that's been a wonderful experience. They ask questions over and over again about the characters in the novels. They tell me which novels they like as opposed to other novels. And it gives me a sense of um, being with them. And that can be dangerous in a way because you can't worry too much about disappointing them or you'll be paralyzed. Right, right. You know, you'll be paralyzed. And one of my writer friends, uh, a wonderful novelist, she died many years ago, um, but she told me once, she said, sometimes the hardest thing to ignore is praise. Mm. If you know that they praised you for something that really is not as good as you think you can do. Mm. You can't listen to that praise, you can't be that satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. You have to go on and keep pushing to do what you feel you should. They give me a lot of feedback. I'm still in the process of finding out what it all means. Mm -hmm. um, I had an experience, which I just mentioned briefly, because I really don't think we should go into it, but I broke with organized religion this summer, and I posted on Facebook that I was going to do it. I said, I quit being a Christian. I can't do it anymore. I quit, and I explained it, and to my amazement, this actually made news around the world, and for about a month, and there were just continuous emails pouring in really by the thousands, right. yeah. and I could never answer all of them, but I answered as many as I could, right. but I was amazed that that happened, and I got tremendous feedback from people everywhere on the page and by email, mm -hmm. and people wrote blog posts about it, and I posted links to those and said, let's talk about this, what do you think? Anyway, it's been a fabulous experience right. for me. Absolutely. I think writers who don't do this for any reason, they maybe should consider it. They're missing something. That, by the way, was what we weren't supposed to talk about. No, we're not going to um, talk about that. Uh, but it, <laughs> we're here to talk about writing. We're here to talk about writing, and we, but we, we do need to talk about Of Love and Evil, which is the latest book, which does deal with themes of, <laughs> okay. Okay. there's a sure. pile of it outside. Sure. Take it if you no. want it. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, what you're talking about is, is essentially the perfect way to market a product uh, for which the market is solitary, reclusive bookworms, right? The internet. How else are you going to reach those people than well, through their computers? I don't, I don't mean I, I those don't people that, to be offensive. I'm one of those people. But the, how to market a book is a challenge that the entire publishing industry is facing right there's now. There's no sure way to market a book. I mean, I have people on the page now that post all the time. They haven't read any of my books. They say, I just love your page, and I love talking about politics, and I love all this, and right. I will get to your books. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> As a fine, you're totally welcome here. Right, you know? absolutely. So I don't know that it's that effective for marketing. I don't know what, nobody knows what sells a book. Right. The, the, everyone agrees that word of mouth sells a book. That's, that, that must be what it is. Mm -hmm. But nobody really knows what makes somebody excited enough to grab somebody else and say, you should buy this book, you should read it. Right, I'm gonna tell a story. This is my favorite story about your career. Yeah, yeah when your are we career, gonna talk about your career? Your career, at the okay. end. Um, <laughs> you traveled to New York, you were releasing a little book called The Queen of the Damned. And um, yeah. you were having a sort of pro forma coffee meeting with uh, someone from your publisher down the street from the bookstore where you were gonna be doing a signing. 
And at this point in your career, you had done a lot of book signings. Just bear with me, Mom. You'll okay. remember the story. <laughs> okay. At this point in your career, you had done a lot of book signings, a lot. And they had not been the affairs that they later came to be. So you and this woman from the publishing company walked out of this coffee house to see the police barricading off the street a block away where you were supposed to be going. And you said to the cops, what's going on down there? And the cop said, Anne Rice is having a sign in. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was, I mean, you talk about word of mouth, yeah, okay, because yeah. the Vampire Lestat had been a bestseller, yeah. but the Queen of the Damned literally tore the roof off of bookstores. They were selling it out of the box in the yeah, store. It, was... it earned back its advance in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Nobody orchestrated that. That wasn't mm -hmm. planned through a strategic marketing campaign with yeah. all the right ads and the right publications. That was mm -hmm. word of mouth. You know? it, it was word of mouth. Yeah, and what's appealing exactly. about your story, even though it's not every writer's story, is that you got there by doing what you were passionate about. I and did, you continued yeah. to do it even when people told you not to. Right. That's true. Yeah. That is really true. And that was a wonderful experience. Yeah. It really was a wonderful experience. But a lot of ingredients go into an experience like that. People back at the house who knew that that kind of interest was building and printed enough copies of the book mm. so that that could happen. You know. Um, Sonny Mehta, the president of Knopf, did that, and I asked him later, how did you know? How did you know to print those copies? And he told me a few examples of things people had told him that indicated that he should do it, but he took that risk. I guess the point I'm making is it's grateful, I'm grateful, it was wonderful, it was incredible, but there are, there's still a great mystery to it and mm -hmm, how it happens. Right. But nobody would have walked up and said, you know, write about vampires and their emotions and feelings and, and make them gay and bisexual. <laughs> and that'll really go over big. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of what's going on right now with vampires? I have friends you know, cautiously approach me to ask me what you think of True Blood. You know, I like... don't know what the hell is going on right now. <laughs> I mean, I thought I knew. Right. Yeah, I was walking around saying things like, well, the vet vampire is a wonderful concept, and it's no surprise that all these new authors are mining that rich concept, and we're going to have vampire fiction for a long time, the way we have westerns and so forth. But at this point, when it just goes on and on and on, I really don't know what's going on. I love True Blood. I'm a big fan of True Blood. I think it's hilarious. I always pretend I'm watching it with my vampires. You know, let's stop. <laughs> Where they are, we're watching them. We're saying, "What slobs! Look at the way they are no! on their clothes. <laughs> so bad, you know." But anyway, I enjoy it a lot, and I've emailed Charlene Harris and told her how much I enjoyed it, and she emails, and we have a nice correspondence. That's great. What do your vampires say about Twilight? <laughs> They're southern, and if you can't say something nice. <laughs> Oh, they're sweet kids, those vampires. <laughs> they glitter, they glitter. It's so sweet. Um, where are we going to go from there? I'm happy for Stephanie Meyer. Yeah. Anytime a writer makes it big, all writers make it big. So These are incredibly, incredibly frightening times in publishing, but the young adult market has remained this yeah, island of success. Good. I don't know if you've read the Hunger Games novels by Suzanne Collins, but I think yeah. they're some of the best things I've read in a really long time. Yeah, that's great. And I, you know, I was staring, you know, because I didn't really read the Twilight books, and I, I, I saw that some of the Harry Potter movies, but it didn't really ring a deep bell in me. I didn't think they were badly written. Um, but somebody said to me, I, a writer friend of mine had decided to write a young adult book, and my attitude was sort of like, how did you do it? You know, it's, I, I, it was all kids mm -hmm. and lollipops and wands, and yeah. she said, you don't, you don't know what's being done now yeah. out there. The, the, the parameters of what you can do thematically, I don't want to say they've gotten darker, but they've gotten more expansive, what you can yeah, talk they, about with sure. younger characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're addressing in some of these books a lot of the themes that you tackled in the vampire right. novels. A sense of isolation, a sense of being apart from God or whatever mm -hmm. you perceive God to be. Right. You know, but the thing to also note about this vampire craze is that recently Entertainment Weekly did a vampire issue mm -hmm. and almost every, they interviewed you for it, but every other writer they interviewed cited you as their primary inspiration. That was nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm but, grateful for that. They also said nice things about Let's Die. The yes, chief vampire. Absolutely. <laughs> the, head, the head of all vampires. I like that a lot. Absolutely. Yeah.
I like that a lot. So I think we're getting the signal that it is time to open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. So I guess what I'm going to do is call on you, and then we have two individuals with microphones who will hunt you down and give, okay, let's see. Yes, right there. What influenced you to essentially go into the family business? Well, <laughs> I did not want to be a writer at all. I had no interest in, I, let, uh, let me back that up. I had an interest in reading, which is really how I think all writers are made. All writers begin as readers, and most of us just write what we want to be reading, like you mm -hmm. said. So I was yeah. a voracious reader, but I, I, I thought I would be an actor. That was really my dream. And I went to college, and no one else there shared that dream. <laughs> Uh, in large part because I was a freshman with a big ego and a bad attitude, and they didn't cast freshmen, period, let alone with big egos and bad attitudes. But uh, I had been a, such an avid theater kid in high school that it had been my primary creative outlet, so much so that I'd never had to develop any other ones. And when I went to college, it was taken away from me. And what nobody could take away from me was literally time spent at the computer creating a world that I wanted to be in. And so I wrote some really terrible plays. And they were all about characters who looked like me ending up with characters who looked like the actor Scott Wolf. And many people were murdered. <laughs> many people were murdered along the way, and it was very exciting. And I was right about everything, because essentially that was the theme of whatever I I think a lot of people in their 20s, that's what they write, is how I'm always right. Um, and so, but what happened for me was I got bitten by the bug. You know, I, I, I loved the connection between me and the words, and I love the fact that nobody could take that away from me. They didn't have to produce it, they didn't even have to read it, but the time that I spent in that world was mine and mine alone. So to make a longer story short, I transferred to a practical film course at NYU. I dropped out and moved back in with my parents, and basically a point kind of came where you and dad were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so um, where the story gets a little serious is you became very ill. Mm -hmm. I had moved out here to Los Angeles on a whim to work on a screenplay with a friend. And my way of dealing with the fact that I was Anne Rice's son was to say I would never write a novel, that I was not cut out for prose. I was cut out for dramatic writing, for plays, for screenplays. And what happened was I came out here to work on one, and I got a call from my father in the middle of the day. It was a December afternoon, and he said, uh, well, I have some news for you. And I knew it wasn't good from his tone of voice. He said, your mother is a diabetic. And I went, Oh, okay, she's a diabetic, she'll take some shots. And, and they also just removed her breathing tube. I, yeah, that's how he told me. I yeah. said, Dad, what do you mean? And it turned out that she had been an undiagnosed diabetic for several months, and she went into something called ketoacidosis. And one day, essentially, she woke up in a coma, and with everyone sort of gathered around her, unsure of what was going on, and you were rushed to the hospital. You were, you were I think, legally dead by the time mm -hmm. you got to the hospital. I think so. And I arrived after all of this and um, planned to stay for a long time. And usually at this point in the story, I talk about how I began working on my first book. And it makes it sound as if I said, well, Mom, you know, I hope you got this coma thing licked. I got a go book to go write. Um, but it was a little slower than that. you know. Yeah. And I, I surprised myself. I never expected to write a novel. It was not my plan. And it took me about three months. And when I was done with it, it was not ready for publication. But I gave it to my father, because you were still recovering. And he said, this is going to change your life. Now, the catch is he didn't say how, but he did say, this is going to change things. You actually kind of know how to do this. He was very impressed. He was tremendously enthusiastic. And he immediately called our agent and <clears throat> told her uh, and, and raved about the book. And she agreed to read it. And uh, then she agreed to show it to people. And um, she did. And two different publishers wanted to publish it. Right. So you were off and running. I was, it was an amazing experience. And at the time, at 21 or 22, you don't quite realize how amazing it is and how fortunate I was. I look back now and realize what a blessing it was to be given that opportunity. But it was really, um, the reaction to it was not one that I anticipated. The, the, the gay readership that identified with the character of Stephen Conlon and Density of Souls and really felt that the character represented their emotional experience in high school, if not their actual experience, because it was a very dramatic thriller. The, that, the force of that reaction to this day catches me off guard. I still get emails about that character in that book. Mm -hmm. you know? And it, it can become a dangerous thing, like you said with the Facebook page, because you think I should be writing Stephen over and over and mm -hmm. over again. And I don't want to write Stephen over and over again. I've sort of moved on from that. So. Yeah. 
Your news character, Toby O'Dare, as I was reading it, I kept thinking, this is the story of Anne Rice's writing. Um, he was a young man, very outgoing, had, had his music, and then a horrific event occurred. Now he's isolated from the world. And then at that darkest moment, he has that epiphany moment when he has to do the profane in his sacred place, and he comes back to God. Um, mm -hmm. was there, is that just blindness on my part, or is that? Oh, is no, there... no. I think, I think you're definitely right that, that um, Toby O'Dare, um, he certainly reflects me. And um, I, I can't write a character that doesn't, to a large extent, reflect my quest, whatever's on my mind at the time, what I think is, is most important. And um, I guess I got deeper with Toby O'Dare into what it's like to live in a family with alcoholic parents than I ever got in anything else that I've written. I got into it some in the novel Violin, but I really got into it in Angel Time with Toby O'Dare. And e even when uh, I'm writing a character like that, who's an assassin, a killer, I I'm writing about my own capacity to be that person, mm. my own capacity to respond to suffering in that particular way. Um, and certainly when he has his, his epiphany or an angel ophany, when the angels come to him and offer him a chance to turn his life around, that, was, that whole thing was expressive of how I felt about one's capacity to do that. You know, even if you're not a religious person, the story is about the ability to change, to, to reach inside yourself and find what's really worthwhile and what's endured all this time and turn away from the things that are destroying you and causing you to um, swindle yourself out of life itself. So I think you're right. I mean, it, it was very much about me. Um, I could not have written that novel uh, if, if I hadn't had Christopher, if I hadn't seen, I mean, Toby's really Christopher's age and is described physically like Christopher. Don't tell people my age. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. I'm going to be Okay. Um, but to Toby, I, I was able to do that character because of watching Christopher grow up in New Orleans hmm. and listening to the kids that came to the house and getting some sense of what it would be like for my hero to grow up in, in, the, in the 1990s in New Orleans. And so, you know, that, that having a child, um, well, it had a powerful influence on my writing in that it gave me access to another generation, really, in an intimate way. Um, there's a lot in the Witching Hour books that I couldn't have written if I hadn't been listening to Chris's friends in the house. Right, the character um, of Mona Mayfair Mona, specifically. Mona Mayfair, yeah. sure. She was yeah. really based on your friend Ashley. At yeah, and you told her that, and she never, she, she uses it to this day. And I don't think she's read the book and knows that that character sleeps with all of her cousins, but. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Ashley. Both you as writers seem as though your books are fairly structured from the outset. I was just wondering if you'd both talk a little bit about your process and how much of it is organic and how much you know where you're going when you, when you set out. Mm. I struggle with this. To outline or not to outline, you know, is really is the question. I, I usually find myself outlining up until a point at which I realize if I continue to outline, it will suck all of the magic out of the process. You know, that I, that I, I always have some sense of where I'm headed. Maybe this is true of you too. But the, every turn and zig, how I get there, I want there to be an accident. I'm working on a novel right now where one of the main characters is a complete accident. He was not in any of my preparatory notes or research. He, I invented him because I needed a point of view in the scene of a horrible event, and he's sort of taken over. And I think if you outline too strictly and if you spend too much time preparing as opposed to writing, you can miss out on those experiences. I make a very conscious effort to make the book interesting and to tell a story and to, be, um, and, and, and to keep that story moving. And it's also what I totally enjoy doing. You know, it's the way the book unfolds for me. And the best criticism I ever heard as a young writer was Aristotle's criticism of the drama tragedy, that it should have plot, character, spectacle, pity, catharsis, and so forth. And I consciously strive for that in my books, to, to, to evoke emotions and, and um, to get really close to the character, make the character alive, and follow what he does in the world. I remember, as a young writer, being very disillusioned with the writers around me who had utter contempt for plot and storytelling who believed it was dead, essentially. They said, plot is no more. It's gone. It's, it's not important. It died with the Second World War. I mean, 
say things like this. And I thought, no, that's absolutely not so. Plot, character, spectacle, all this is absolutely important. People are totally entitled to that. But you know, you've got to have a great narrative pace. So to me, that narrative pace is more important than anything else. And I think I've written some pretty badly structured books. Uh, but that narrative drive goes on right through. And like The Vampire Lestat is, is, in a lot of ways, a bad book because the plot doesn't <laughs> exist. I mean, it's essentially the journey of the hero, and then bam, it's, you know, it's over. But then, I just saw tomorrow's headline. The Vampire Lestat <laughs> is a bad book, says Anne Rice. But, but, but um, I usually do outline somewhat in my head or prepare. I have to have kind of a roadmap of where I'm going. I didn't when I was younger, but I do now. I don't want to just tunnel into the book anymore the way I did when I wrote many of my earlier books. I don't want, I don't want to take 70 or 80 pages to figure out what the theme is. You know, I want to have some idea ahead of time. And um, also, I think as you get older, you should get better at saying what you mean. <laughs> you know, you the, should learn something. But anyway, I, I, think it, I think structure is very, very important. No, nobody really, well, with few exceptions, nobody really gets a big audience if they don't pull you through a story. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Tolstoy and Chekhov are just magnificent at this. You know, I sat down yesterday when I couldn't write and I read two or three stories by Chekhov. They were just brilliantly plotted, you know. They weren't necessarily about anything terribly dramatic, or maybe, maybe a relationship between two people or the scope of a man's life. But I mean, the, the narrative drive was fabulous. The, the action verbs, the concrete nouns this moving these people through time. And I mean, to me, I value that above everything else. So I guess that becomes the structure to answer your question. Yeah. I read the two Christ books in your author's notes. You said that it was your belief that the four gospels had been written before 70 AD. But right. Not to badly paraphrase you, but because it was such an event that uh, had they been written after 70, they certainly would have been mentioned in that. That's right. Um, I'm not a scholar, I'm not even a deep student, but um, I've never heard anyone else say that, let me put it that way, and especially about John, which I've heard dated to 100. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? What, what brought you to that statement, that conclusion? Well, it, I think the, mo the more I studied scripture and the more I studied the gospels as literature, which I couldn't help but do as I read them, you know, read them as stories and narratives, um, the more I felt there were personalities in control of those narratives. Now, we don't really know for sure who they were, and we don't know when they were written, but I, I sensed a personality, and I sensed some kind of communication between the different gospel writers, different attitudes to things. And it seemed to me, the more I read the history of, of Jewish literature, the Jewish Bible, um, all of that, that absolutely, if these had been written after the temple had been destroyed, they would have mentioned it. They would have not failed. They would have punched it hard. They would have punched it hard as saying, look, this is what happened. You know, Jerusalem rejected Christ. The temple was destroyed by the Romans. They would have drawn, um, they would have drawn that out. So it, it well, they, would, they wouldn't have missed that opportunity because the whole reason for them, for Christianity, was, was that they were not satisfied with Judaism at that time. They felt something more was needed. And, and they felt Christ was providing something that the Jewish law had not provided, which is a pretty arrogant thing to believe, I think. But they did believe that. And they wouldn't have failed to mention the fall of the temple. So, and, and there was another reason why I was sure they were written before the fall of the temple. Um, they contained so many embarrassing and strange things. If they had been written later by a committee of church people, if they had been assembled and edited, they would have been smoothed out. They would have been made to agree with, with one another. They, all the embarrassing moments and the, and the strange moments would have been taken out. So all of that conspired to make me feel that they were the work of individual authors, possibly eyewitness, and they were written early. You know, we, we, but, but all of this scholarship, the, the, nobody can prove any of that. You know, all you can go by is internal evidence. There really is no external evidence. And the maddening thing about that field is people make pronouncements all the time as if they had real evidence, and they don't. Until somebody opens a jar out of, out of the desert in Judea with another manuscript in it that upsets everything, we, we are left with the manuscript evidence we now have, and we're left with internal evidence. It meant a lot to me in writing those books 
to really immerse myself in all of that material. And it enabled me to really get into those novels and, and to feel like I was right there in the Second Temple period and I was right with Jesus' family and really understood him in that, in that Jew, Jewish milieu and as a member of a Jewish family. It was, it was quite an experience writing those two books. It was in some ways the most joyful experience I ever had with writing. Thank you for that question. Hand right here, down that row. I'm a social worker and I work with people who are homeless and living with mental illness. So when I'm reading both your books, mm -hmm. I'm also reading through a social work perspective. After you released, I believe it was Memnock the Devil, you did an interview on Charlie Rose. I, I did what? An interview on Charlie Rose. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the interview, I had already read the book. And the work, the book was, was piercing. And in the interview you said, writing that book nearly killed me. <laughs> yeah. And when you said that, I wondered, how does working on the dark side of the cosmos so much, does that take a toll on your psyche? And if it does, how do you manage that? Well, it, it, it does take a toll. I mean, I really believe that you have to give everything to a book. And you can nearly die writing that book if you, if you are willing to go all the way with it and not compromise. And over and over again, I've emerged from writing books in, in a black depression, almost unable to function. Memnock the Devil was one, Violin was another, um, The Vampire Mond was one. I mean, the, there were any number of books that I came out blackly depressed because I went all the way with my fears Mainly my fear, mainly the basic fear that life is meaningless, that there's nobody in charge. And that fear is something that never leaves me for very long, that we will die without finding out any answers and uh, we won't have, you know, I used to think when I was young that we would know the answers when we died, that somebody would tap us and say, there are no answers, you know, and you would, you would know, okay, it was meaningless. <laughs> then finally it hit me, you're going to die without anybody telling you one way or the other. You may just stop existing and you will never know you know, who was right that day in March when you had that big fight with your husband. You will that's never what it know. Comes down to. Well, no, that's just, <laughs> stop it. There's that's the hand, just... There's a, I got the hand, <laughs> finally, one. That's just, that's just one aspect of right, it. I mean, you're right. never gonna know anything. Right. And, and when I pursued that in my books, when I pursue that over and over again, when I get back to all these basic questions, you know, is there any justice, really? Is there a, a loving personality in charge of the cosmos? Is, maybe there isn't. Well, what do we do? What's right? I mean, how do we live with our guilt? We're all killers. We're all vampires. We're sitting on this stage now while people are dying in other parts of the world. They have nothing to drink, nothing to eat. They're, they're, they're dying of diseases, and we're sitting here. You know, we, we just ate in a fancy restaurant. We're all killers. We're all murderers. Our hands are bloody. Okay, well, that can drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world, audience. And you mentioned you had a lot of people who were critical of your writing work. I was wondering if it was the love of writing that kept you going or, or if there were particular people who helped you. You know, what got you beyond the criticism and gave you the courage to go forward? You know, I, I don't know what gave me the courage to go forward because I, I was very sensitive to the criticism and I was always being set back by it. But there was something ruthless in me that wanted to be a writer, really ruthless. I really just wanted to reach for the stars. I, I wanted something exciting to happen. And that desperation just kept welling up in me. I just kept writing no matter what anybody said. You know, I, I wrote um, a book as, as a young woman that it never went anywhere. You know, it was never, I was shown to a couple of editors, they never responded, nothing ever happened with it. But I just went on. You know, I felt like, okay, I didn't, I didn't get the intensity I want there. I really didn't do it, I didn't break through. So I just kept trying to do it. And um, my husband understood this. He understood it very well. Uh, he was very different from me and he had completely different values in terms of literature as a poet. 
and later a painter. But he really, he really could never have written a novel, and certainly he had no respect for the marketplace or wanting to be. He didn't really read novels. He wasn't no, a novel reader. No, not very reader. much. Yeah. He, he did like James Lee Burke. He did, yeah. He did. But that was later in life that mm -hmm. he would read a novel like that. But, right. but he was really, um, he didn't understand what I was trying to do, all the forces I was trying to bring to bear. But he did respect something in me that wanted to do this absolutely. So he was very, very supportive. But I think it was really just a ruthlessness in me. And after our daughter died, uh, she died when, right before her sixth birthday, I remember it was very hard for me to get a job. He had a good job, he was a teacher, and he could make more uh, in a week than I could make in a month. And um, he said, stay home and write. And that, that was tremendously encouraging. He said, don't worry about a job, just stay home. I believe in you, just, just work on your book. That played a huge role, it really did. Because I didn't have anything to justify staying home. I, was, you know, I felt I should go out and work. I didn't feel that he should support me because he was married to me. Um, and he, he did say that, and I remember that, and that being very, and I did write an interview with the vampire. And then I remember the morning I finished it, I gave it to him. I'd been up all night, and I gave him the manuscript. And I went to sleep, and he woke me up that afternoon, and he said, it's really wonderful. It's really great. And, and he gave me that invaluable support. But I was very stubborn, and I was very, um, very desperate, and I might have been able to do it without that, but he certainly gave me invaluable, <coughs> invaluable support. Uh, this is for Mrs. Rice. You've been writing, or were writing, about uh, sexuality, bisexuality, gay love, long before it became something that was even discussed uh, on television, Will and Grace, all of this stuff that you see now. I've always wondered where that came from, where the interest in that, and, and for it to connect with so many characters that everybody here loves, but just where that came about, that, that mm -hmm. they were connected in that way that you know, not many mainstream people would have done. You know, I, I really don't know the answer to that question, um, except that when I would start to write, that's what would happen. I would become completely enamored of these characters, and they would move in the direction of transcending gender, and sexuality and sensuality were tremendously important to them. And I believed completely in the goodness and the rightness of that. I, n nobody was ever able to convince me that sex was bad or that homosexuality was bad or anything like that. And I don't know why that is, because I grew up in a Catholic household, but it was, I grew up in New Orleans, which is a very strangely, wonderfully tolerant city where Catholicism and religion in general are different, really, from the way they are in the rest of the country. You know, it's a city that really just goes completely mad on Mardi Gras and for two weeks before, really, and then mm. everybody gets up on Ash Wednesday and goes to church and gets ashes on their forehead. <laughs> and, but, you know, this, this was a wonderful milieu to grow up in. Because, and I remember my mother being extremely tolerant and extremely understanding about all things that pertain to sex and it being extremely loving and being very open on that subject. So, but why a writer writes about that, say, as opposed to something else, I really don't know. It was something that I simply couldn't keep out of my work. You know, my characters loved one another, whether they were two men, two women, a man and a woman, a man, a woman, and child, whatever. It, it, it's been described by uh, friends and critics as polymorphous sexuality sometime in the Vampire Chronicles. But whatever it is, I stuck with it, and that's where I find the feeling of authenticity. So, thank heaven, I was able to make it feel pretty authentic for readers as well. But I don't know why I'm, I'm as obsessed with it. I, th I think I'm, a very, I'm very angry at religion for the way it treats gay people. I'm very deeply angry at religion for the way it treats sexuality in general. And that comes out in me creating an ideal world or a better world in which my characters don't suffer because of those things. They go forward, you know. You know, I'm sitting here watching you talk and watching your expressions and the way you, you know, smile and your eyes. And I'm thinking about when you write about characters and the physicality of the characters. Is there a different process when you're thinking about, as opposed to thoughts and physical movements? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I see the characters. Mm -hmm. And they're moving, and it's like a movie. It's just like mm -hmm. a movie's going on right there in my head. 
Um, I see them, I see their gestures, it, I, I see what they're doing physically, uh, I picture them vividly, and uh, I've even mumble out loud as I'm writing, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, the lines of dialogue to each other. And it, it's really effortless for me to, to do it that way because that's the way I see it. What, mm -hmm. what would you say? I heard an actor say to me that he doesn't have stage fright, he has reality fright. And I think that's a, a description of a lot of writers. I, we were talking about this before we walked on tonight, that the idea that we're actually doing this right here is kind of nuts. Because what we do is essentially we stay alone in a room, mm -hmm. you for most of the day, me for half of the day. Um, <laughs> we live in this, we inhabit this imaginary world, we do everything we can to get, de get it down on paper, and if we're fortunate enough to be successful at it, we're asked to go out into this fearsome real world that, that I don't feel all that comfortable in and talk about it. You know, and so the world that she's describing, that she sees, is far more comfortable to me than this one. You know, so I, it, it, it doesn't require a great deal of conscious effort no. to yeah. to enter it. You know, yeah. it isn't like painting. It's like, it's like painting, but the brush is attached to your hand. If that makes yeah. any sense. Mm -hmm. Do we have a question over here? At the beginning of the conversation, you guys were talking about how many writers find themselves in a situation where they're pandering to to somebody that they've never met and trying to craft a book that ultimately doesn't become something that they would have written themselves, but they're trying to appeal to somebody. But um, it sounds like you embrace Facebook a lot, and you get a lot of comments, whether they're warranted or whether you've asked for them or not, and maybe praise and thoughts of, that people have. I'm, I'm wondering if you ever had a fear that while trying to write to your audience, you almost would pander to them because you know what they want, and you, you're almost not writing from what you would have originally written if you almost lived in a vacuum and didn't have that instant feedback. Um, I think you addressed a lot of that. Yeah, you know. um, there's no consensus mm -hmm. in my audience about what the books mean or which are the best books. And that helps a lot with that. There are people that have only read the two novels I did about Jesus Christ and the more recent books, and there are other people that read the vampire novels and won't read those new books. It just absolutely won't. So all that helps me to keep perspective that there are all these different kind of camps in that audience. And you know, there are, if, you, if I go on Amazon and want to read the reviews, which I don't recommend an author do, but if I do, <laughs> I mean, I can find people saying, you know, this is the only good book she ever wrote, all the rest is garbage, there, I, you know, or the vampire list out was the beginning of the end for her. But let's draw a line between social media and bloggeria which is like a whole other thing, right? Because there, there's social media where there's a, there's a general, often a general respect between the people who are interacting with another, on your page at least. But then there are blogs where people under assumed names write the most attention-seeking inflammatory stuff that they possibly can. And if a writer goes on there and reads that, they're looking for an excuse not to write. I'm, I'm just speaking well, from my own experience. Right. Yeah. When I go mm -hmm. to look at that stuff, I'm looking to have my worst suspicions about myself confirmed <laughs> so that I can go to the gym earlier and think about other things. You know? <laughs> and so, but there's a difference between what you're doing yeah. and what a lot of the internet offers you if you just start doing, doing yeah. searches of your work, which I don't recommend to anyone. You can't write for your audience no matter how much you love them, right. you can't. You have to, what my audience wants of me is that I give them what I want to do. Mm. That's really what they want. They don't, they want me to put my heart and soul into a new book and surprise them. Right. That's really what they want. They're counting on me to do that. And they're always, they're always gonna be people that are gonna be very angry with whatever I do. I mean, that's the normal process when I publish a book is that people say, well, this is not what we wanted. We wanted an interview with the vampire. Or, mm -hmm. We can't stand the vampires. We wanted the witches. Or we wanted another Christian book. Or we wanted, you know, or when are you going to do something like Cry to Heaven and Feast of All Saints, your novels that didn't have supernatural characters. That's the only good stuff you ever did. Mm -hmm. well, you know, so I'm used to that. I'm used to that outcry, that first outcry. And then it takes a little while for that book to find its audience a little while for it to get out there and, and people begin to get it. So I have to remind myself of those things. And I have to steel myself against that. And I have to do the book that I really believe in right now, the book that obsesses me and the book that won't leave me alone. Like right now, I'm writing a, a completely new novel about these immortals that came to the earth in the time of Atlantis and have survived into the present time. I'm doing this just because I want to do it. 
I've always wanted to write about ancient Atlantis, the legend of Atlantis, my take on the city, what it was, why it was destroyed, and I want to deal with immortals that don't have to kill people every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm really having fun doing this book, but I, I expect a lot of people to say, why the hell did you write that? <laughs> When you're developing a character and you get into them so much, do you ever have them answer you back? Or do you get into dialogues with them to the point where they have their own say in things as well? Well, I, I don't know if they answer me back, but they certainly take on a life of their own. That cliche is really true. It is true. And they come to life in weird ways. I mean, like I never intended Lestat to be a character. Mm -hmm. You know, Louis, the narrator of Interview with the Vampire, was the character. I didn't care about Lestat. He was just a bad guy. He suddenly took over the book. And when I came back to write the second book about the same set of characters, he was the one who was totally taking over my mind. So I wouldn't say he argued with me, but I'd say he obsessed me. And he took on a life that I couldn't totally rationally account for. In, in my novel, Christ the Lord, the Road to Cana, uh, there was a character living in Nazareth, this totally fictional character that's a friend of Jesus in Nazareth. His name is Jason. He does the same thing in that novel in a way. He springs to life and begins to have long conversations with Jesus in the novel. And Jason's the most lively, wonderful, fun character in the book to write. And he was completely unplanned. Mm -hmm. He's just this sort of intellectual who lives down the street in Nazareth, mm -hmm. who was in a scene and was kicked out and has traveled the world but come back to be in his own village with his grandfather's fig trees. And, and, but that character just, and things like that, that's some of the most wonderful stuff about writing is when those characters come to life and when they take over like that. Um, Lestat lives with me all the time. I go into a hotel and I think, boy, Lestat would really like this, you know. <laughs> like, look at this lobby, look at this flower arrangement, he would really love this. Mm -hmm. Clothes, you know, I, I see clothes in an ad and think, oh yeah, that's what he would be wearing right now. But I've, I've not had that experience with every character I've written about, but that's about as far as it goes with me. I, they don't really argue with you, they just become part of you, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the character that I'm most afraid to write is the one I can't face right away, and so I work my way around to them. That's why I've had those experiences like you described, where these characters feel like accidents. They're unplanned. I have them walk up to just give the piece of the mystery that's going to set the hero off on his quest, and suddenly I realize there's way more juice to that guy. He can't walk away so quickly. Mm -hmm. And then I realize that there's usually something going on in that character that really troubles me very deeply. You know, in that, that case, I'm writing a book set in New Orleans again, and, I'm, and I introduce this character who's, who views this murder, but what I realize is that this character, when we first meet him, hates New Orleans and has contempt for it, and he needed to come to love New Orleans, which is sort of the reason that I'm writing this book. So he stuck around, but if I had outlined that, I would have shut myself down, you know? It's almost like describing what your book is about in advance as opposed to saying I'm going to write a story in which the vampire tells his story, as opposed mm -hmm. to saying I will now sit down and write a novel about immortality, philosophy, religion, the, question for, the quest for meaning in mm -hmm. life. You, know, you can't approach it that way, or at least I can't, because it's just, mm -hmm. it, it causes lock hands. Right. On this side. Has any directors tried to approach you about another movie about one of your books recently? Uh, well, we are always in talks <laughs> with a number of people, <laughs> a number of people. There, there is a constant interest, and I have very, very good agents, and uh, we are in talks. And right now, things look very good on several of the books, but it's too early to really announce anything. But I, I love film with my whole heart and soul, and I want all my books to be made into films. And I've always wanted that. And I'm very open to any suggestions that are coming from anyone. Um, I hope we'll have some exciting news on a number of my books in 2011. And I hope on yours, too. I, I hope. I hope. Yeah. To speak from my end, which wasn't the question, but I, I'm up here. So um, <laughs> <laughs> mysteries have become harder to sell to Hollywood because what you can do on television now with a crime drama, drama is so much more expansive. The, the atmosphere is so much more permissive in terms of content. And when you go out with mysteries like mine for a movie sale, which is what I would like to see, they say to you, well, why can't this be a Law & Order episode? Or why can't this be on CSI? And, 
And uh, the answer is because I don't write for either of those shows. But so the climate for the type of books that I've written has changed. But I, I don't think, you know, I think cable is a wonderful venue for a lot of adaptations, like we saw with Pillars of the Earth and, and other things that are going on, much more than it was just, say, 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. when you started, before you started writing. Yeah. So many, how about right here? I've always been fascinated by all your historical references and your stories, and I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little more on what kind of a processes you use as a writer, what kind of methodology you use in collecting information that is of historic relevance to your books. Well, you know, I, I've always loved research, and I've always loved reading history, and I read it every day. I mean, it's what I read for pleasure is history and biography. And the stories not only give me the facts and the details about another time, they inspire me. You know, I stumble over um, wonderful stories in history, and I think, well, I've got to write something about that time. I've got to put somebody in that time. How, how incredible. Um, and I, one time a friend of mine said something that I thought was really illuminating. She said, you use these historical settings the way science fiction writers mm. use speculative settings. And I think that's true. But I, I, really, I really love to work with that level of spectacle in my writing. I find that exciting. Um, and I don't fully understand it, I just sort of accept it. You know, it, it, one thing that I'm very proud of is that usually my historical facts are accurate, that the costumes are accurate, the, spe the, speech, is, the speech is an illusion. You know, you're not, you're not really writing what somebody said in 1200 AD. You're, you're writing what maybe they sounded like to themselves in 1200 AD or someone else. But I try to get all the details Right, and I get more and more interested the longer I go on. Um, there's more specific history in my last two novels than in most of the novels I wrote. There are settings in the earlier novels, but there's real specific history in Angel Time and of Love and Evil. Um, I'm really fascinated by the history of, of the Jews in Western civilization and the interaction of Christian and, and Jews and the stories that people don't know about that interaction. And I love writing about that in the Toby O'Dare novels. The Toby gets sent back in history basically to interact with Jews that are praying for, to God for some sort of help, and they're usually in some kind of a dilemma with a Christian community. And I love writing that stuff. I love thoroughly researching it and coming up with all kinds of aspects that people just don't know. Thank you so much for speaking about the um, believing in yourself fiercely and recklessly because you listening to you has just um, made me stay all the more determined about seeing a book through that I want to get published. But I'm facing the eye of the needle. Writing the book was long but easy compared to how do I deal with the damn query letter? Mm. Uh, you know, how do I... It, there seems to be such a format, a brief format, to put all your passion and convince somebody that they want to read, read your uh, manuscript. And any tricks that, uh, or any suggestions or advice would be very welcomed. You, it's a tough one. I, I, I've never had to write a query letter, but I, I've talked to people who had, and I've talked to the people who read query letters. And, and what one uh, woman who worked at a, at a pretty highbrow literary agency said to me is that she reads them with a highlighter and she looks for the ingredients. So uh, the passion is important, but she's looking for not necessarily saleable elements of your story, but things that set her off, that get her excited. Uh, location, cultural references that are included in your story, a type of character. And if she likes it, she highlights it, and if she doesn't, she doesn't. And it's a really cold and, and um, kind of defeating way to think of the process, but that, that is how it works for this one woman. Um, it, it's hard to pitch your own work. It's a staple in Hollywood, but for novelists it's almost impossible because we don't think in single sentences. I mean, like, people ask me to pitch my work and I go, well, it begins on a night in February. You know, and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, like, uh, you gotta pitch me in five words, you know, which to me is just terrifying. But not, I don't think publishing asks you to be quite that concise, but they ask you to paint a kind of broad stroke that uh, kind of picks up all the tasty bits of your story. The people that I know uh, in publishing really want to read the manuscript. Mm. They don't care what the letter says. Now, you know, when the few times when I go to them and say, I know of this writer who I think is really good, they say, email the manuscript. 
email the whole document. That's all they really care about. I, you know, I do want to say this, and this is not what you're asking, but I feel compelled to say it. I don't think it's any harder today than it ever was to break in. Really? I think it's, it's always been hard. We sat around in the 60s talking about how impossible it was. Mm -hmm. Books cost too much. People weren't buying them anymore. Nobody wanted to spend what a, a, a new first novel costs. Mm. Uh, you, you had to know somebody. It was difficult. They didn't read your stuff. They dismissed you. We were just as discouraged. We felt just as excluded, just as outside, just as desperate. My, my feeling is, after watching all this for 35, 40 years, is it's no harder now. The arts have always been hard. If you had been dragging along the road to go to Epidaurus in ancient Greece to be in the plays, you know, that were written by Aeschylus or Euripides, people would have told you to go home. They would say, the competition's too stiff, they're never gonna deal with you, you're from the provinces, the Athenian actors have it locked up. <laughs> you know, if, if you're not sleeping with the playwright, forget it, you know. Yeah. It's, it, your voice is no good, you look funny, you're short, you know, all mm. of the stuff that they tell you now about breaking in. But the people I know in publishing are as hungry as they ever were for new voices, new ideas, to be blown out of the water, to have, to have new books, and so forth Th and so on. I think this is really true. And, it, and when you go into a television studio or, or a television network office to pitch a story, all those people sitting at that table really want to be blown away by your pitch. Mm -hmm. They want it to be the one that will be the next top-rated show. They really do want that. Mm -hmm. And you can feel that. So. But there There's are, no reason not to go for it right. and, and just realize it's always been difficult, it's always been competitive, there's always a bottleneck at the top, and mistakes are made all the time. And just keep going. And right now there are some changes taking place in the delivery system. And it's easy to confuse a conversation about those changes with the place of literature in society, and we shouldn't do that. There's, there are some real things happening. The mid list is shrinking at publishing houses it's across the country. It's always shrinking. I mean, it's shrinking do really. Mom, ever it's said, really shrinking. Did, did I mean, it's really, like, like did there anybody are. Anybody ever want to say, I want to be a mid list writer? Whoever, no, but they used to know. end up on the mid list, and now there's nowhere for them to end up. They're ending up with okay. their contracts canceled. It is a real thing that's happening, right. and it's okay to talk about that, but I think it's happening in large part because there are these changes in the delivery system taking place. We don't know what the role of ebooks are going to be, and it's made things very uncertain for people whose work isn't a surefire marketing success. It's true. I, I'm sorry, I gotta say, it's going on out there. You know, Borders is now hovering on the brink of bankruptcy. Things are changing, and we don't know where the chips are gonna fall. But we do know that writers are getting book deals after publishing books themselves as ebooks and selling uh, startling numbers of copies. We know that the game is not necessarily being played in exactly the same way anymore, so there is opportunity out there. So I essentially agree with you, don't give up. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the playing field and look at the new opportunities and go for those and let go of the stigma that may exist around many of them. Yeah, I, I think all that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, for me, I don't have a lot of time to read, so my wife introduced me to audiobooks. And I have a job where I'm alone a lot of the time of the day, so I listen to them all day long. Do you think that helps with the media of people getting more into the books? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, do, do I think the audiobook is a good thing? Do audiobooks draw people into the real oh, book? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, anything that gives, gives people a taste of, of the experience of books, I think, is a really good thing. And there are a lot of people listening to audiobooks on the road. You know, you go into a truck stop in Florida, and you can find all kinds of sophisticated audiobooks on the racks for the truck drivers to buy. And if that gives them the experience of an author and stories, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's the same with Kindle, with ebook. You know, people who are coming to literature through Kindle and ebook that maybe wouldn't have come any other way, and they get to love books. And it's the same with, as you mentioned, with television shows and miniseries. People buy the books after they see the program. Or they, they watch a show like Bones and they see that it's based on a series of books and they want to read those books. So I think all of that is part of the experience. It's, I don't think authors or publishing ever gains anything by rejecting any new technology. You know, all technology can broaden the audience for literature. It, it's, it's, it's very important to embrace that technology and to work with it. We have to get to people where they are. Like any product, we have to reach people where they actually are. And if, they're, if, if it's not a uh, given that they're going to be walking through a Barnes & Noble next week or an independent bookstore, we have to get them in their cars or on their handheld devices. It's just a reality of the business, I think. You know, and it's one, a good thing. One time I opened a six-pack of Coke in our apartment in Florida, and there was an ad in that Coke 
done by um, Jane Friedman at Harper for a new novel. Mm. And I thought, how incredible, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is in Coke being sold in uh, Navarre Beach, Florida. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was weird. And I so admired Jane for that. I don't know how the novel did. I should have asked Jane <laughs> <laughs> how did this novel work out, you know? But, uh, Some thought, kid named Tom Clancy, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Tom Clancy. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you, Ted, for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.